Welcome to FFRF's Ask an Atheist, our new Facebook Live program. And we will be taking your questions about atheism, free thinkers, and state church separation. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. And I'm Dan Barker. Annie Laurie and I are co presidents of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, which produces this new weekly show. I'm Andrew Seidel, a constitutional attorney here at FFRF, and today we are celebrating our independence from religion. In honor of July 4th, we'll discuss our Declaration of Independence, but also the importance of declaring your own independence from religion. And as we begin, we want to invite you to post comments or questions right here on Facebook. Or you can send an email to askanatheist at ffrf.org. If you want to talk live to us, you can reach us on Skype at live colon FFRF dot studio. We welcome questions from believers as well as non-believers. So invite your religious friends and your religious relatives to join in too, as we honor Thomas Jefferson's wall of separation between church and state. That wall of separation is an American original. The idea stems from the Enlightenment, but it was first implemented in the American experiment. Until then, no other nation had sought to protect the ability of its citizens to think freely. No people had tried to divorce the terrible power religion holds over this supposed afterlife from the power government has in everyday life. Until then, the freedom of thought, and even the freedom of religion, could never have truly existed. America invented the separation of state and church. And we ought to be proud of that contribution to the world. Yes, we should. And that contribution is more likely to advance civilization and human progress than any other governmental policy. And at FFRF, this is what we fight for. We have two purposes. Uh, and we work for the separation of church and state and to educate the public about non-theism. Um, but the United States of America, um, this name that was given to us by Thomas Paine, was the first to advance this concept of separation of church and state and that we declared independence as a nation from religion and government. And um, Well, that's what we did on July the 4th, 1776. And the declaration says, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. And that's how our declaration opens, with a reliance on natural law and a deep concern for human events. That ought to be obvious, but some believers are blinded by their faith. They think the declaration is a Christian document. And nothing could be further from the truth. There are four mentions in the document that believers rely on for this claim. The laws of nature and of nature's God, their creator, divine providence, and the supreme judge of the world. But none of those is explicitly Christian. The first, which Dan read, is clearly about natural law, and the second is deistic at best. And more importantly, the Declaration is an anti-biblical document. It situates power in the people and establishes the right and duty of those people to revolt against their government. And according to the Bible, Including the New Testament, governments are, are ordained by God, and to rebel against the government is to rebel against God. And uh, that rebellion, prohibited by the Bible but embraced by our founders, uh, made America possible, and it made it possible the freedom from uh, the freedom of conscience guaranteed in our First Amendment. And the Declaration of Independence, of course, was signed in 1776, but our living Constitution, which is godless, was adopted in 1787, and that was after four months of debate that was entirely without any prayer, and that showed intent. And uh, we should be very proud that the U.S. Constitution is the longest lived Constitution in the world, and I believe this is in part because it separates religion from government. 
and in 1791, the Bill of Rights was adopted uh, to uphold individual and minority rights. And some of you may have caught the annotated constitution that was in the New York Times this Sunday. It was fascinating. And it began with an essay by the great Gary Wills, who called this document a child of the Enlightenment. And in his essay, Wills points out the document they conceived bears many marks of the age of reason, especially the separation of church and state in the First Amendment of Madison's Bill of Rights. This is the one entirely innovative element in the Constitution. Everything else, separate, uh, separated powers, federalism, the uh, executive branch, uh, independent judiciary, had uh, been known in theory or in practice or both. Gary Wills wrote, only this was truly new. Ours was the first nation started without the assistance of an official deity or cult. Fascinating. But lately, the Supreme Court seems to be turning its back on that hallowed principle. In 2014, for example, the court decided that companies like Hobby Lobby Boo. have religious <laughs> beliefs. A company has a religious belief and that they can impose on their employees. They can deny women something as personal as insurance coverage of their choice of contraception. Then, last week, in a breathtakingly terrible decision, the court did something that flies in the face of our founding principles. The court said that even when a state constitution prohibits funding churches and ministries, churches can demand taxpayer funding. The Freedom From Religion Foundation submitted a brief in that Trinity Lutheran case, along with the ACLU and Americans United. We were all shocked at the court's decision. James Madison, the father of the Constitution and the father of the Bill of Rights, opposed even a three-pence tax, known as threepence in the parlance of that day, three pennies that would go to church schools. This case, uh, last week involved $20,000 going to a Christian learning center that is, according to the church, an integral part of its children's ministry. Now, we've written and talked about this opinion a lot elsewhere, and we're not going to rehash it here. But I will say this, and I say it as an attorney who works for, as a, for a living to keep state and church separate. If we rely on courts to ensure our secular government, we're asking for disappointment. In my opinion, we're going to win this fight with demographics. That's one reason why I end every talk I give around the country for a call to non-believers to publicly declare their non-belief. Come out of the closet if you can do so safely. And we've encouraged people to do so with our Out of the Closet campaign. And last week we showed Andrew's out, out video. And today I thought we could show one by Jarvis Idaway, who's a former legal intern, and Charlotte Stein, who's a former staff member. My name's Jarvis, and I'm an out of the closet atheist. There are many reasons why I'm an atheist, but I'll start with the crudest explanation I'm sure many of you have seen Clash of the Titans or The Immortals or 300, these blockbuster films about ancient Greek or Roman religion, which we now call mythology. But back then it wasn't mythology. It was very real for them. They genuinely believed that you had to put a coin in a person's mouth before they were buried so that they could pay for the literal ferry to the afterlife. Just as many people today believe that they should eat crackers and wine on a Sunday, or that God wants women to hide their bodies under black burqas. Every religion that has ever existed, and there are many, have all believed that they were right, that their rituals and rules and beliefs were 100% correct, and they all thought they nailed it. But where are they today? Uh, if they're not completely forgotten, they're on the silver screen, amusing us with their sword fights, animal sacrifices, and oracles. The religions of today are the entertainment of tomorrow. Everyone, I hope, is an atheist about Zeus and Apollo, Juno and Poseidon. I just added Jesus and Muhammad to that list. I'm Charlotte and I'm an out of the closet atheist. I've always been intrigued by religion and when I was younger, I desperately wanted to be religious to be more accepted by my family who was in majority Catholic. My parents didn't raise me religious. 
I was never baptized. I never took communion. Well, once I took communion, uh, it was a pretty bad idea. I don't think it was worth a church full of angry elderly who glared at me as I waved the communion wafer back and forth asking my grandma what should be done with it. Also, the wine was pretty gross. From this experience and countless others, I came to three conclusions that sort of dictate how I live my secular life. One is that I find people of faith to be more exclusionary and less accepting. Two is that I would rather work to please the people around me who I care about than someone who, to my knowledge, doesn't exist. And three, that I would rather help people than pray for them. So that's a great video. Uh, we also encourage people as part of our out campaign to create a digital billboard that you can display on social media. I put mine up the week before Easter uh, and because I think Christianity's central tenet, which is vicarious redemption through human sacrifice of Jesus, is immoral. In mine, I said that I think we, er, I said earlier, I think we can win this fight with demographics, and I've actually got some studies to back that up. But do we want to maybe show some of these, these out campaign uh, posters before we do that? Well, yeah. there are some up here now we're watching. So this one's, Gre this one's Greta Christina, who's actually Chris written quite a bit about coming out of the closet. She came out of two closets, so she's got some good advice. And There's Stephen Pinker, the honorary president of the Freedom from Religion Foundation. One, one of our favorites. So um, I've got some studies to back, back me up on the importance of coming out of the closet. And in March 2013, a study came out and it showed that 28% of the people who support gay marriage actually once opposed it. So 28% of the people changed their mind. And of the group that changed their mind, the largest group by far, 32% changed their mind simply because they knew somebody who was gay. Everybody knows an atheist, they just don't know that they know an atheist because atheism is easier to hide than being gay. But it's time to stop hiding. It's time to come out of the closet and say, I am an atheist and I don't give a damn if you think less of me or whatever other non-religious label you prefer. Can it be hard? Yes, it can be hard, but nothing worth doing is easy. So at the Freedom From Religion Foundation, we're declaring our independence from religion, and we hope you will too. And the more of us who do so, the easier for every other non-believer and for the following generations. And I'm living proof of that because I'm a third generation free thinker. And uh, I have to ask, um, boy, is there, um, nothing to feel apprehensive about or apologetic about in making known our dissent from religion. Uh, free thought is respectable, the use of reason in forming your opinion about religion, and it's really religion, religionists who should be embarrassed <laughs> about um, taking everything on faith or tearing their reason out of their eyes, as Martin Luther urged, um, who, who live by blind faith. They are the ones who ought to be embarrassed about making their knowns, their views known publicly. <laughs> We live in a proudly rebellious country. We fought a revolutionary war, declaring our independence from the sovereign, from the monarch, from the king, from the Lord up above. Instead of cowering before a dictator, earthly or divine, we should celebrate our freedom to dissent, to say no. Now, if you agree with us, and especially if you do not, We'd like to take some of your questions and some of your comments. This is a live show. They can be about the Declaration of Independence or the formation of our secular nation or about the perils and pitfalls and the pleasure and pride that come with being an out non-theist. So do we have any questions here, so uh, Andrew? We, we do, actually. Yeah, we have quite a few questions. So Matthew Hohenstreet asks, how do you suggest responding when people say things like, be blessed, or God bless, etc.? His father is a Southern Baptist and loves to claim that America was founded by God-fearing Christians that were a Christian nation, and it drives him nuts. And then he wants to know if we have some bullet points to confront that stance. Well, Dan always likes to say, if you feel it's safe, that's a funny thing to say to an atheist. Right. <laughs> or you can always say, um, I appreciate your your wishes and your sincerity, because people aren't really thinking about what they're saying. Sure. They're saying, bless you, or, you know, 
Uh, or, when, or when you sneeze and someone says, God bless you, you say, well, that's nice, but you know, that is a funny thing to say to an atheist because I don't believe in spirits yeah. and blessings. Uh, so you can handle it any, any way you like according to your personality. But uh, as, as you said earlier, we shouldn't hesitate to come out. It, it's hard to recognize that you're talking with an atheist. It's, we don't wear these, what, crosses? Well, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes we wear our infidel shirts or yeah. our friendly neighborhood atheist shirts. I wore shirts. at the farmer's market this weekend. <laughs> or the little uh, Dawkins A-pin or something. Uh, or we could walk around like this, I suppose, you know, <laughs> let people know we're not evil. But uh, my style is just to be friendly about it and assume the best about the person. They're saying... Merry Christmas to you in a sense of wishing you well during the season and you can say well happy winter solstice to you you sure. know some way to respond in a in your own way yeah you can appreciate the sentiment without agreeing to the underlying religion yeah. involved in it and I, then for the christian nation i mean there's so much to say about this but i think the best probably bullet point primer would be the non-tract that FFRF produces is america a christian nation yeah. and you can get that right on our website and it's got all kinds of great primers uh, on Go to on publications, FFRF.org publications, and there's a link to, you can download it for free, or you can order them and hand them out when you're being given religious tracts. Yeah, and for, for me, that's probably the, the one of the biggest bullet points is the fact that the Constitution is a godless document, and all mentions to religion in that document exclude religion. They keep religion out of government and government out of religion, and to me, that that pretty much should end the debate right there. Yeah. And maybe if you're listening and you have some rejoinders you want to share, um, please feel free to make those comments or Skype that in. And they'll go right to Andrew's iPad. There yes. you go. And so we actually have one that's a little more specific, but also tied to Matthew's question. And it's, Cat uh, Marshall asks, but aren't there mention of God in the Declaration of Independence? Doesn't that make America a Christian nation? And so we mentioned the, the four pieces of verbiage that mm -hmm. are supposedly make us a Christian nation. It's the laws of nature and of nature's God, which is very much a reference to natural law. I mean, that's not Christian. If anything, that's pagan, right? Nature's God. Well, you said earlier that it was deistic. So explain the word deism. So deism, for those people who don't know, is basically there's a creator God, and he sort of created the gears of the universe and set it in motion and then ignored everything else. It's, a, it's not... It, there's no real religion associated with it. It's just kind of this generic belief in a creator God. Be, before, before Darwin, the Enlightenment thinkers like Jefferson and Thomas Paine didn't have a mechanism for like, well, where did it all start from? And so in their minds, and Thomas Paine used to talk about, this creator doesn't write books. Just look at the trees, right? This creator doesn't talk to people, doesn't do miracles. Uh, it's more like the force be with you almost, like it, it's gone. And we're left basically to live, I, I think we could describe Jefferson and Payne and some oh, others as not just deists, but maybe practical atheists. In their daily life, they didn't pray or talk to a God. They didn't look for any of these things. They just lived like you and I would live. I and of course, uh, Thomas Jefferson predicted that everybody would become Unitarian. <laughs> Prediction was not right. <laughs> Unitarian. He, he was derided as an atheist when he ran for president. He later cut up the Bible, the famous Jefferson Bible, taking every supernatural bit that he and everything he disagreed with in the New Testament about Jesus out of there, including, only looking... Including the virgin birth and resurrection. Yes, no, no miracles, nothing supernatural, only what he thought were the palatable moral teachings. And some of them were not palatable and were cut <laughs> out. So, yeah, he was a, he was a classical deist, a, a free-thinking deist. Yep, and both he and Payne were derided as atheists, even though... And I guess, not a Christian. I guess your point is that our founders could have, but did not say, based on the authority of the God of the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, he, they could have said that, yeah, right? absolutely could have. And, and there were that. some who wanted that, actually. There were a few extreme believers who wanted to put God in the Constitution, but they deliberately did not. They deliberately did not. And it's, the same holds true for the Declaration. You know, those four mentions, none of them is Christian. And actually, none of them, with the exception of their creator, the creator, none of them appear in the Bible. And the, again, the creator just goes to the, the deist God. So none of them appear in the Bibles of the time. And if you look at the Declaration, you know, it's really basically, it's basically two paragraphs, then a list of 27 crimes that the King George III committed, and then another three paragraphs. And it says that there should be um, consent of the governed. 
Yes. This is an anti-biblical precept. Yes. I mean, this, this isn't the, something to do with That's religion. one of the two major principles in the Declaration. It situates power in the people. And the second one is that we have a right to rebel. And both of those mm -hmm. are totally. directly contradicted by the Bible. Right. And King George was being indicted for these, was it 23 crimes? 20, I think 27. 27 crimes. King George was not only the sovereign of the nation, he was also the head of the church. The at defender the time. of the faith. So here's a declaration indicting the head of the church for crimes against humanity. And actually, interestingly, this didn't make it into the final version, but uh, there was a mention of Christianity in Jefferson's rough draft, and it attacked the Christian king for yeah. engaging in the slave trade. Well, too bad that that didn't stay in. Too bad that didn't stay in. And, and, and the, the, the con condemnation of slavery, which the slave trade, yes. he knew was wrong to, to delete that. And the, uh, the only mention in Jefferson's original draft of those four was the laws of nature and of nature's God. Well, so we have something else there? We do. We, um, so we have uh, Denisa Geddes asks, how do I politely tell Jehovah's Witnesses to stop bugging me? I will not follow <laughs> any religion. <laughs> oh, here's a good idea. <laughs> when they come to your door, say, oh, I really would love to talk to you, but I'm busy right now. Can I have your home address and I'll come visit you next Saturday morning when you're trying to sleep in? <laughs> One thing that I heard recently at a talk I was giving, um, a gentleman keeps a stack of FFRF's non-tracks next right. to the door and gives them out to people that want to drop off religious literature, and I That's love that idea. That's what they're there for, That's and we have a, a sample pack that has all kinds of topics in it. So, I think so I'll trade. Idea. You give me one, I'll give you one. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, personally, I love to talk about this kind of stuff, so I'd be happy to engage uh, with, with anybody on it, including the Mormons that come around our neighborhood, though. You invite them in the house? I try not to spend so much time on my weekends doing that. <laughs> we do enough of it here on the weekdays. <laughs> so Leslie Purdue asks, are there any organized efforts nationwide to repeal blue laws? So blue laws, for people who don't know, are those laws that uh, they're, they have a religious history and they're, they limit the sale of alcohol based on, basically based on the Bible. Um, and not that I know of, but they have been struck down on several occasions. And any law that is based specifically on the Bible, including Sabbath laws, is struck down. Those laws have to have some secular backing behind them, as and we they, all know. They often, though, will find some secular pretext. So we've had this problem in the state of Wisconsin with car dealerships mm -hmm. that are not open on Sundays. Yes. And uh, it's sort of unassailable because they're using other arguments, but it really does derive from a blue law. Well, the law says uh, on your Sabbath day, so a Jewish car dealership uh, can be closed on Saturday instead of on Sunday. But wasn't there a big controversy uh, a century ago about uh, Sunday mail delivery? Wasn't that? It was, uh, it used, yes, they suspended it in the 1820s. It was the Christian party in politics was lobbying and there used to be mail delivery when our, when our nation was founded, when the Constitution was signed. You would get mail delivery on Sundays. And there was objections because they felt some of the men going to the post office would stop off at the local tavern. <laughs> that was probably what was behind that. So our country has lost some ground very early. And there's actually a great report that was authored um, by, by a couple members of Congress about Sunday mail delivery. I think it was 1840s that the report came down. There's some very strong language for the separation of state and church in it. Um, and the post offices in the Constitution, too. Um, Jill McConnell asks, were any of the Founding Fathers specifically non-religious and not deist? Uh, yeah, well, Ethan Allen, if you consider him a founding father, wrote the first free thought book, Reason, the Oracle of Man. The only oracle or, of man. only oracle of man. And I'm assuming he was, I don't, it's a little bit on, it's hard to read that book. It is, it's not. <laughs> it's very um, verbose and, um, but I believe he was a, a non-theist, at least an atheist. I don't know what he called himself. But I mean, is deism actually a religion? There's no rituals, there's no church going, there's no missionaries, there's no... Deism is more of a philosophy, right, than an actual religion. So maybe we could call the deistic founding fathers non-religious in that sense. I think that might be fair. And even, even though, you know, the religious founders, a lot of what they did, I mean, George Washington is a great example of this, you know, he would go to church, 
but it, he felt it kind of this duty that was tied to his old office when he was, you know, this English country gentleman. Um, when he did go to church, and it was very rarely, he would never take communion. He would never take communion. And he would often which, leave early. Which was very important. He, and, w he wasn't buying that. And when he, when he was dying, he w it took him a couple days to die, and he had no priest or clergy come to his bedside. Uh, you know, he was, he was a scientifically minded man and, and he rejected was, all the trappings. He was probably the most conventional of the, the main biggies, too. So that's, he was an unconventional person. But was he religion. going because his wife was actually going and he was accompanying her in those cases? He frequently did, yes. Yes. So, I, I mean, and you know, when he, if you look at his private correspondence, I think he mentions Jesus once, maybe twice in, you know, 1,700 plus letters. That's, that's not something a believer would do. And I would not consider Thomas Jefferson to be religious. I would not consider James Madison to be religious. I mean, if you cut a, take a razor, literally take a razor to the Bible to cut out the supernatural stuff, I think it's hard to, to label that person as a, as a Christian. The Jefferson Bible, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think that's difficult. They were very free thinking, and if they had had the advantage, as you pointed out, of Darwin, they probably would have called themselves atheists. I, th I think that might be true. Uh, Curtis Hutchinson asks, how should the atheist diversity problem be addressed, referring to the fact that most atheists seem to be white men? Well, you do need to put up um, you do need to promote um, diversity by having diversity at your, as much as you can at your public functions, and um, we have the out of the class. We have the, um, we have just decided the winners of our free thinkers of color, students of color essay competition, for example. Why diversity of backgrounds there, um, and. Uh, but I don't think most atheists are men. The majority are, there are more men than women. Um, and the uh, percentage of blacks, for example, African Americans, who are non-religious is almost the same as white. It's you know, maybe a four point difference. So there's just more whites. So you're going to have, you know, if. Um, yeah, is it, 20, does, it, does it reflect right. the actual breakdown right. of society? So, in, in the United States. Or so what I think the question is asking is, among organized groups of free thinkers and atheists, and to be a member of a group like ours, you have to have some discretionary income, you have to have some leisure, you have to have you know, some ability to join. And just because of the advantage of being a white American, you're more likely to have those advantages and the ability to join a group. That doesn't mean that, uh, that, not, that blacks and other minorities don't have a, the similar uh, percentage of non-belief. It's just that they're yes. less likely to be able to join a group like ours. And also, uh, so important in taking major Supreme Court cases, such as Alton Lemon, yeah. the Lemon Test, Ishmael Jaffrey, who we recently had on our radio yeah. show again. Ernie um, Chambers. Uh, Ernie Chambers of um, t taking um, Stone Marsh v. versus Chambers. Stone v. Graham, wasn't that the? I don't know the, I don't know the racial component yeah. there, uh, but I mean, there's not that much establishment clause law. That's <laughs> over-representation of minority um, non-religionists there. So very proud of, of all of them. So we have a question from Susie Miller, who I think might be a believer. She asks, why is In God We Trust on our money if we aren't a Christian nation? Question mark, question mark. <laughs> I, I think I would flip the question. Why does In God We Trust being on our money prove that we're a Christian nation? Or you could flip it and say, if we are a Christian nation, why doesn't it say in Jesus we trust? There you go. Instead of just this generic God, right? And, and so first, of course, it was added to our coins in the 1860s during the height of the Civil War. I added to one coin at the very end of the Civil War and, uh, by a, a Baptist minister writing the Secretary of War, as they properly called the Secretary of Defense then. It got on one coin at the very end and then gradually got on the coins. But it wasn't on the currency until an act of Congress in the mid-50s. Yeah, during the height of the Red Scare. And, um, and then it was adopted belatedly as a motto of the, day, the year after. They said it had to be in all the money. So it's a Johnny-come-lately, in other words. And it doesn't belong there. And we have tried valiantly to get it off. Um, Michael Newdow, there are many, many lawsuits. Um, it's been called ceremonial deism. It has not been called Christianity. But we certainly think it's a violation. And when it was put onto the coins, it's, it actually is a pretty interesting story because the 
Mark Watkinson was the preacher that you're talking about. Yeah. And he, he wrote to, I think it was actually the Secretary of the Treasury, who then got with the director of mm -hmm. the Mint, and it was just these three guys that really yeah. did it. And they thought that the time was propitious. You know, that was the, the and, language that they used. And they, they said, we want to relieve this nation from the ignominy of heathenism. Yes. Mm -hmm. That is not a secular purpose. No, it was, it was absolutely not. And so it's basically just these three guys sneaking in the back door while the country's busy tearing itself apart and fighting the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, they kind of snuck in and just said, well, we're going to go ahead and do this without But And then it was notice. very, very gradual. I mean, it mm -hmm. took almost a century before it got on all the coins. And Teddy Roosevelt famously tried to get it off, That's because, right. partly because he thought it was blasphemous almost. Well, and, and you can certainly make that argument. If you truly are religious, why would you want your God on filthy lucre. Especially when it is a, an idol or a graven image, which would violate one of the Ten Commandments. There's also the wartime angle. During wartime or during the Cold War, a few people desperately wanting God on our side, similar to how the German military had God is with us on their uniforms as well. We needed God on our side as an extra edge to win this battle. So. Um, it was not an act of Congress back in the in the Civil War when that happened. Then. I think it, definitely not when it first went on. I think they ratified it after the fact at some point. I don't remember. I think you said after '65 or something after Eight, the war. Oh, oh, 1864 okay, is when it 1864. first went on. And wasn't there not another motto that uh, Franklin suggested? Mind your business. Right. It, yeah. Now Franklin. It was a very distinguished committee of Franklin, um, Adams. I mean Franklin. Jefferson. Jefferson and was it Adams? No, who voted for in, uh, for e pluribus unum, which is also our motto. It, it was not supplanted by "In God We Trust." It's also there on our coins mm -hmm. from many come one, which celebrates our diversity, the the states uh, functioning with the federal government. It's a very nice motto. Much better, in my opinion. So we have another one that's tied to this, and it's a little hard to read here. My name is Mahanid. I was always asking myself, why is God, In God We Trust written on the $100 bill? We all know that there's no relationship between God and the banks. But what's your opinion about using the concept of God for economic interests? And so I'll just throw, at, just to kind of top onto our conversation, we actually learned when we were taking these lawsuits against In God We Trust, we learned that a lot of the reason they were trying to put it on, on the bills, on the paper currency, was because they wanted to use those, that money to kind of proselytize for this, this sort of American religion. Mm -hmm. um, they wanted it to get behind the Iron Curtain. Oh, you mean money spent in Europe and all over the uh, world with our motto on it, huh? Exactly. Uh, so it, it had, a, again, a non-secular a non purpose behind it. So it really, there's no legal constitutional reason it actually should be on there. And of course, we have fought hard, but we'll keep someday, fighting. Someday we'll get it scraped off. Um, we have another question from Michael Peacock. Uh, where and how do I become an activist? So it looks like he's already an atheist, so how can he become an activist? Well, I don't know where Michael lives. Yes, Michael Peacock. I mean, the, plug yourself in to whatever's going on in your community. Um, and if you encounter a state church violation, Michael, um, you can try to fight it, but also uh, you can contact FFRF. There's a report of state church violation at our website under the legal link. Um, you can work with us. You can get plugged into all kinds of regional free thought groups. Um, FFRF has members in every state. We have 20 chapters. There's all kinds of things that need to be done. Um, just start doing them. I, th I think a simple answer would be complain. If you see a violation of state church separation, write to the principal. Go to the mayor. Go to your governor. Go to wherever this violation is happening speak up and complain, and that's what activism is. And that's how you started as a college student. You complained about prayers at your graduation, and you got it pretty and quickly changed just by complaining. It was, like I've said, the easiest um, <laughs> violation that I ever stopped, and it was one of the bigger ones that I ever stopped. It was so simple. I went before a committee of four students. I was shaking. I was scared, and they were nodding and smiling <laughs> at me, and then they voted right away, yes, let's stop prayer at the invocation, and they took it to the chancellor, and he said, sure, and that was <laughs> it. So you never know. I mean, it pays to complain. It pays to make a fuss. It does. And, and for me, again, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, this is the advice I give at the end of every talk. It's if you, if you can, come out of the closet and don't be shy about being a non-believer. I think that's one of the most effective things that any individual can do to help 
the secular movement. And maybe there'll be some more suggestions coming in um, about how to plug someone in as, as an activist. And our whole Declaration of Independence was one big complaint. It was complaining <laughs> against the crimes, the uh, yeah. you know violations of human nature. So. And I have Same to put way. in a word for what Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who rewrote the Declaration of Independence with a set of grievances against male-dominated government. She took that verbatim and then turned, it was, the, the tyranny was male government and to keeping women out. I didn't so. know that. I'll have to go read that oh, one. Oh, yeah. That's, I, and it's up, you can read it at the Seneca Falls um, Convention site. It was an old Wesleyan church, and I'm glad to say the church <laughs> isn't there, but they have the pillars and they have each very declaration cool. there. Yes, it was a very a clever um, um, protest that they made in 1848, the women. We have another one. This, was, this is a pretty good one. Brian Byrne asks, what's the easiest way to know if you're safe to come out to your family and community? For instance, if I come out and my family hates it, what should I do? Um, and I, I think, well, I think one of the first things that you should do if you're thinking about coming out is to try to build yourself a little support community of your own, even if it's just online, or even if it's among your friends, or if you know there's maybe one sympathetic family member, because it, it can be a hard thing to do. Um, you know, for me, I had a pretty easy go of it. Um, and when I, I remember when I told uh, my dad and stepmom, my stepmom said, wait, so you don't believe in anything? Hmm. I said, no, of course, not. there's lots of stuff I believe in, friendship, love, all this stuff, I just don't believe in God. And that was about as rough as it got for me. But for some people, it can be pretty hard. Well, I think Dan. Well, it depends on your family, so there is no right answer. In some cases, you might have to keep your head down. If you're a, a teenager and you expect your parents are sending you to college, you might want to kind of wait before you let them know that. But uh, in my case, my seminary-educated dad and my Sunday school teacher mom they were shocked, but eventually they were thinking, and they eventually became atheists, and so did one of my brothers. And so I never would have known that. And I, I, what my mom says was that she said, well, I know Danny, and I know he's a good person, and I know he's moral, and I know that he wouldn't just make this up unless he was taking it seriously. So that prompted them to do their own research and their own studies. But maybe your mom and dad are not like that, and only you know that, only you would know how to navigate that terrain and the timing that's involved as well. And of course you're looking at this in hindsight, your whole career, your whole income, your whole life, your family, everything was tied up in religion. So for you, like many of the members of the clergy project, this is a life altering announcement. But for perhaps a person who's not all tied up in the ministry already, you're going to have to judge for yourself, um, you know, whether this is going to alienate you to the point where um, you'll lose your family. In that case, you might just want to avoid the topic. But on the other hand, if people don't know who are atheists, mm -hmm. as you pointed out, um, uh, then they don't realize there are nice people who are atheists. They just think of them as um, mythic ogres and <laughs> evil people. So if they know that it's you, it could make a big difference. And I think this is that's a good reason for people who are atheists to know they'll have an easier time of it, who have uh, maybe a liberal family, maybe a family that doesn't appear very religious. Uh, it's a good reason for them to come out of the closet because they will make it easier for those people who are stuck in very religious communities or families. They'll make it easier for them by you know kind of paving the way. Is there another question? Uh, this looks like a comment from Kathleen Hooks Lemarie. We must do everything possible to stop any more religions sneaking in to our government, I presume, especially since it's becoming so blatant. I'm a Christian that supports the separation of church and state and a veteran who served for 24 years to preserve the freedom of all religions, including your right not to believe in a religion at all. Good for you. And I think, I think that's a good, maybe a good place to end. We can thank Kathleen and all the other atheists in foxholes that are out there. And we have a monument to them at Free Thought Hall. That have fought since 1776 for us, 1774, really. And <laughs> yes, so they're, they're um, deserving of our applause, but anybody who declares their independence from religion and works for separation of church and state, we're very um, delighted. So what's the show next week going to be? Uh, creationism. Yeah, what's the deal with creationism? And evolution, is, and we're going to have our first Skype guest, uh, Jerry Coyne. So, 
So come back next Wednesday. Friend of FFRF. And are, are you guys, you're doing something fun on creationism. Yeah, soon. well, we'll talk about that. We're, we're going to be uh, going to the dedication of the um, Clarence Darrow statue in Dayton, Tennessee on July 14th. Um, there's been a lot of threats. There's been uh, <laughs> amazing um, a controversy there. Um, there was a, a meeting on July 1st against us where they said, the Founding Fathers weren't atheists and they weren't evolutionists. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, they were not evolutionists. <laughs> so, so anyway, we'll be talking about that time. and creationism and evolution uh, on Ask an Atheist next week. So if you like the show, you might consider becoming a member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Uh, join us at FFRF.org. And then if, don't forget to send any ideas for future shows or um, any questions you want to send to askanatheist at ffrf.org. Or you can send a Skype question just from using your computer or a camera. Uh, our Skype handle is live colon ffrf.studio. And yeah, you can call in and join us live on, on this FFRF Facebook show. And that's going to do it for us this week. Yeah. So join us again next week for Ask an Atheist, for FFRF's Ask an Atheist. Freedom.